Returning to the main discussions around Britain leaving the EU, the tone of the meeting was one of sadness and regret. But there was an agreement that the decision of the British people should be respected. And we had positive discussions about the relationship we want to see between Britain and our European partners and the next steps on leaving the EU, including some of the issues that need to be worked through and the timing for triggering Article 50. Let me say a word about each. First, we were clear that while Britain is leaving the European Union, we are not turning our backs on Europe and they are not turning their backs on us. Many of my counterparts talk warmly about the history and the values that our countries share and the huge contribution that Britain has made to peace and progress in Europe. For example, the Estonian Prime Minister described how the Royal Navy helped to secure the independence of his country a century ago. The Czech Prime Minister paid tribute to Britain as a home for Czechs fleeing persecution. Many of the countries of Eastern and Central Europe expressed the debt they feel to Britain for standing by them when they were suffering under communism and for supporting them as they joined the European Union. And President Hollande talked movingly about the visit that he and I will be making later this week to the battlefields of the Somme, where British and French soldiers fought and died together for the freedom of our continent and the defence of the democracy and the values that we share. So the Council was clear that as we take forward this agenda of Britain leaving the European Union, we should rightly want to have the closest possible relationship that we can in the future. In my view, this should include the strongest possible relationship in terms of trade, cooperation and, of course, security, something that only becomes more important in the light of the appalling terrorist attack in Turkey last night. Mr Speaker, as I said on Monday, as we work to implement the will of the British people, we also have a fundamental responsibility to bring our country together. We will not tolerate hate crime or any kinds of attacks against people in our country because of their ethnic origin. And I reassured European leaders who were concerned about what they had heard was happening in Britain. We are a mu proud, multi-faith, multi-ethnic society and we will stay that way. Amen. Turning to the next steps on leaving the EU, first there was a lot of reassurance that until Britain leaves we are a full member. That means we're entitled to all the benefits of membership and full participation until the point at which we leave. Second, we discussed some of the issues which will need to be worked through. I explained that in Britain there was great concern about the movement of people and the challenges of controlling immigration as well as concerns about the issue of sovereignty. Indeed, I explained how these had come together. In turn, many of our European partners were clear that it is impossible to have all the benefits of membership without some of the costs of membership. And that is something that the next Prime Minister and their Cabinet is going to have to work through very carefully. Third, on the timing of Article 50, contrary to some expectations, there wasn't a great clamour for Britain to trigger this straight away. While there were one or two voices calling for this, the overwhelming view of my fellow leaders was that we need to take some time to get this right. Of course, everyone wants to see a clear blueprint uh, in terms of what Britain thinks is right for its future relationship with the, EU, with the EU. And as I explained in my statement on Monday, we're starting this work straight away with a new unit in Whitehall, which will be led by a new Permanent Secretary, Oliver Robbins. This unit will examine all the options and possibilities in a neutral way, setting out the costs and benefits, so that the next Prime Minister and their Cabinet will have all the information they need with which to determine exactly the right approach to take and the right outcome to try and negotiate. But the decisions that follow from this, including the triggering of Article 50, are rightly for the next Prime Minister. And the Council clearly understood and I believe respected that. Mr Speaker, I don't think it's a secret that I have at times found discussions in Brussels frustrating. But despite that, I do believe we can be proud of what we've achieved, whether it's putting a greater focus on jobs and growth, cutting the EU budget in real terms for the first time, reducing the burden of red tape on business, or building common positions on issues of national security, such as sanctions to stop Iran getting a nuclear weapon, standing up to Russian aggression in the Ukraine, and galvanising other European countries to help with the lead that Britain was taking in dealing with Ebola in Sierra Leone. In all these ways and more, we've shown how much more we have in common with our European partners as neighbours and allies and friends who share fundamental values, history and culture. It's a poignant reminder that while we will be leaving the European Union, we must continue to work together for the security and prosperity of our people for generations to come. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah.